We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Feel free to, to participate in this online chat uh, discussion. Uh, if there will be any uh, technical problems, please, uh, you can uh, send it in chat or contact directly to uh, Anahitia. Um, and um, I, I think, um, Anahitia will help to, to solve uh, any technical uh, problems that may appear. Uh, this um, During this session, uh, we will be talking about uh, the, uh, the virtual uh, space of museums and the situation uh, that appeared uh, in 2020 uh, when the um, pandemic was announced in Poland and in uh, a lot of other countries too. And we had to redefine the role of day-to-day uh, -day operation of uh, our uh, museums and uh, change uh, the forms of activities that we uh, offer our audience. This uh, new situation has changed the way that uh, digital works uh, work and um, the perception of um, museums, uh, edu educators, museums workers, and um, of also the uh, different needs uh, of um, museum public uh, that want to still participate in uh, culture, by, but uh, in the different and new way. Um, the internet has become the only uh, platform for contact with virtual cultural uh, heritage and uh, communication be between the um, institution and uh, our audience. So uh, today, during this uh, panel, we will uh, have a chance to, to see uh, two examples of uh, Polish uh, two leading museums, uh, how they, they deal with this uh, situation and uh, what kind of solutions were proper and the best and good practice uh, for uh, this time. And then we will have the opportunity to discuss it uh, with uh, the specialists, uh, representatives uh, of uh, uh, civil uh, organization and also the social media expert uh, to discuss about the tools uh, and the means of communication of, uh, between the museum and the public in, uh, in the pandemic time and uh, what will be the future of, um, of this virtual uh, space of a museum. Uh, we will try to evaluate the effectiveness uh, of uh, museum activities and tools uh, that we use on uh, our website and diagnose, uh, make a di diagnosis of the needs of our um, audience uh, for, for now and for the future. So uh, at the beginning, I would like uh, to, to ask the representatives of the museums in, in Poland, and then we will, uh, uh, we will uh, join the, the bigger conversation with uh, representatives uh, from uh, um, social media and also uh, from a civic organization. So in this um, panel, uh, the, we, we will have a chance to talk with uh, uh, Tomasz Bednarz from uh, National Maritime Museum in Poland, with uh, Karolina Tabaka from National uh, Museum in Warsaw, and uh, fr uh, with uh, ja uh, Aleksandra Janus uh, from uh, Centrum uh, Cyfrowe, uh, and also with um, uh, Anna Szała um, the representatives of uh, social uh, media. So now I would like to, to ask um, Mr. Tomasz Bednarz, a representative of a National Maritime Museum in uh, Gdańsk, to join us and, um, uh, and to present the um, you know, solution 
uh, and the way that uh, these museums uh, communicate with the audience uh, through uh, virtual space. Um, Tomasz Bednarz is the underwater archaeologist. Uh, he's the head of uh, the digitalization department in this museum. He also uh, took part in numerous underwater uh, archaeological research projects organized by this museum and is also um, the uh, initiator of the project uh, entitled the Virtual Open Air Museum of Shipwreck in the Gulf of Gdańsk. And this project was uh, awarded in 2016 by uh, the Polish Ministry of Culture uh, as the museum uh, event of, of this year. So uh, please, uh, Tomasz Bednarz, take uh, the floor. Uh, we, please unmute. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning, still. So maybe it's the best chance to show our works with the digitalization with the new ways or new times is to show you my presentation about the, our way of this digitalization. We are strictly mm, mm, try to show the audience, the people who want to visit our museum beside the physical visiting, visiting uh, in the museum. We also would like to show our, um, our exhibitions online. So we prepare the 3D models of the muse muse museum objects and uh, we, we, we could do this in different ways. So I think it will be, it will be um, quite um, interesting for the people who wants to know something more about the um, ways of uh, uh, the, the, the new ways uh, uh, which the museums can show the, the exhibitions and the museum objects. So let's, let's try to... Uh, can I start the share, uh, share my screen? Can, can someone... Uh, at the bottom, there, there is share screen uh, sign, share screen. green one. But, but now is the host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, I'm just looking and also I'm because I'm co-host, I cannot make you a co-host because someone else make me. So I think uh, I can raise this uh, favor and question to EGF. Um, the main host, so he or she can uh, make you also the co-host and then you will be enabled uh, to That's share. Okay. Well, I will write a chat on the chat and I'm just um, also speaking out loud. So I hope that the person who is responsible for making you uh, a co-host is, is hearing me right now. Okay, so we have the answer that he or she will do it right now. So we have to just have, take a few seconds maybe, mm -hmm. then you will be able to share your screen. I will show the information about the virtual, virtual open air museum of the wrecks of Bay of Gdańsk. Uh, it's just my, my opinion and not only my opinion, this very unique project um, which uh, allowed to, to show the, how the wrecks on the, on the Baltic Sea looks like. I mean, especially the, the wrecks uh, of the archeological sites that which Oh, yeah. Start. Yeah, it, it seems so, that now you you can you can do it. So just check if it's okay. Great. Okay, now you can see. Yes, we can see perfectly. Okay. So this is the title of my uh, presentation: How we share our digital world, 3D models from uh, from the National Maritime Museum in Gdansk. So let's start. Uh, what we can uh, let's see what we can see. Uh, the National Maritime Museum in Gdansk has been developing 3D digitalization techniques like photogrammetry, laser scanners, and optical scanners. 3D technology is used to exhibit exhibition and multimedia presentation and applications containing augmented and virtual reality, available stationary and online. 
and you can see the how it's our museum looks like in the glance maybe if some of you visited in the, in the, in the past uh, our museum maybe remember the um, some some uh, characteristic object if not in in the future of course we invite you to dance to visit our museum too and we have a few branches uh, in, uh, in the in the museum besides Gdansk, we have also a fishing museum in Hel, Dar Pomoza in Gdynia, and Visual Lagoon Museum in Kontrybatske. A 3D documentation allows to make a precise measurement of monuments and create their 3D drawings, documentation, as well as to make the cross section of monuments in any places. The most precise 3D scanners used in our museum are to have accuracy of mapping real objects of the level of 40 micrometers. In 2015, we have launched the virtual open air museum of the Rex of Gulag Dance project, financed with the funds of the Minister of Culture, National Heritage, and the, our museum. Uh, this object presents photogrammetic 3D models of Rex from the Gulf of Dance created in, to, in our museum since 2013. The models present careful copies of, of an, an actual appearance of the Rex lying at the bottom of Gulag Dance. This is how the underwater archaeologists see them in the course of their work. Expect that the visibility underwater is, is most often limited to two or three meters, while the Virtual Operating Museum of Rex website provides the full view of the wreck. Beside the, beside the 3D models, there is on, on the site also the um, animation of, this, of the models and some more information about the history of the research and uh, about the monuments took from the bottom from the from the uh, wrecks and uh, which now are in in our uh, exhibitions the website now cons consists 25 3d models of wrecks with their descriptions photo and video documentation the wrecks come from the 15th to the 20th century all wrecks were excavated by the museum and the artifacts from them now are on the museum exhibitions. The website is available in Polish and English language. The wreck, the wrecks can be viewed with the three dimensional virtual reality goggles like Google Cardboard or Oculus or other. The site is used for edu educational purposes during the museum lessons, for example, uh, and on, you can see the the three D uh, the kind of uh, virtual uh, three the, the cardboard or or the the goggles for three uh, D um, how to and you can see how to you can sh see the three um, D objects. Besides this, our, this, this project, we have also a virtual tour of museum ship Dar Pomoza. It's quite new offer for the visitors and for the people which away from the dance. Dar Pomoza is a museum ship. It's not, this is not an easy object to visit due to historic structure, especially this, for this disability uh, and the elderly. Uh, that is why the virtual tour was in, in, introduced, introduced to the offer an interactive spherical film integrated with modern Oculus goggles. The virtual tour is also available online on our museum YouTube channel. Uh, the, the quite uh, almost the same way is, is uh, we, we used the, this uh, the same equipment on. on to, to show the show the ship, uh, which also is also our uh, our part of our museum, virtual tour for museum ship, is due to the limited possibilities for the people with disabilities to get the how to the ex ex exhibition on the museum ship. So that a multimedia VR stand was built in the renderings in Ovianka. The virtual tour also allows people with physical disabilities to take in an interactive walk around the ship's halls and the permanent exhibition. 
With a mobile, moni mobile monitor or a 3D goggles, the users may visit places such as cargo holds, boiler room, and engine room, seafarers' cifer cabins, a galley, mess, and uh, wheel halls. Maybe probably in the future you can pre prepare the online version of this um, of this new new project for the salt and the three D technology in the museology can be successfully used in temporary and permanent exhibitions, multimedia presentation, as well as applications contain augmented and virtual reality. Three D digitization. In, in, is also successfully used to the scientific documentation of collection in museums. 3D technologies used in neurology can be divided into three groups, such as photogrammetry, optical scanners, and laser scanners. Photogrammetry, precisely the photogrammetry structure from motion technology can be used in on the water archaeological documentation, as well as in the documentation of and archiving the state of preservation of monuments. The SFM technique allows to change the photogrammetry 3D flat image into a 3D spatial image with the actual color recorded in the photos. In order to create the 3D model, the, the photos must be taken correctly. But if if the people, if the, for example, underwater archaeologist uh, can do this uh, after some practice, it's quite uh, easy to to do to do this. But uh, finally, on the beginning, uh, there is sometimes problem with uh, this uh, this this uh, this uh, technique of documentation. But uh, as I said, it's quite, quite uh, easy to do when you have uh, some practice. The greatest advantage of this technique is obtaining visually attractive 3D models of relatively low production costs. The disadvantage is a much lower accuracy of mapping compared with two models made with the use of 3D scanners dedicated to specific tasks. And these are examples of photogrammetric 3D models of objects from the NMM collections. Now you can see beside the 3D, with the, beside the 3D models of the wrecks, we can also so make, thanks for this technique, also the monuments which are in the collection of our museum. The second group of devices used in the 3D digitalization of historic objects are 3D scanners of structured, uh, structured lights, so-called also optical scanners. These scanners can be used for small and medium-sized objects from several centimeters to several meters. This group includes stationary scanners, usually uh, cooperating with the tablets of routing platforms and handheld scanners. The measurement precise of in scanners uh, of this type range from half a millimeters in the case of devices dedicated from uh, to the objects to half meters and several to several to even a few micromet micrometers in the case of devices dedicated to making 3D scans of small objects up to 20, 30 centimeters. This is, this is, the, is the disadvantage of these scanners is that they have a work, a, a work at least in partial shading, with, uh, which eliminates them from outdoor use. Optical scanners emit structured lights, most often white, less blue or green, uh, in the form of parallel lines, lines. The lines falling on the scanned measured object change their position showing the shape of the object. The camera or cameras installed on, installed on the scanner record the distance the gap between the lines. And on this basis, the scanners generate, generate the 3D models of the real objects using dedicated, dedicated software. In the museum, 
are used two optical scanners, Smartec Micron 24 and Artec EVA. Handled Artec EVA, EVA structured light, this scanner allows, thanks to their built camera, to generate 3D models with extras reflecting the real color of the scanned object. This scanner is dedicated to scan medium sized objects from half a meter to several meters. The device allows to generate high resolution textures and safe model in any in many outputs formats, including OBJ, VRL, and STL. The last format uh, allows the direct 3D printing of the model. The scanner works with a dedicated Artec Studio software. This software allows to precise combine individual scans and sessions into a compar compressive 3D model of the measurement object. And you can see the, the, the examples of these uh, 3D models of humans from museum with the use of the optical scanners. Oh, this is the the same the same uh, way of uh, the same uh, equipment and more examples of uh, using this this uh, this standards and the last group of the tools of for creating 3d models are laser scanners they are used in mesology mainly to uh, scan large size objects including architectural archaeological and geodetic in, in inventories they are also kind uh, widely used in, the, in, in industry, mainly in the innovation and modernization in, of infrastructure. They are especially commonly used in the shipbuilding industry. The accuracy, the accuracy of measuring individual sky points in devices, in devices is, is the type is uh, the average from the one to two millimeters, and the range of the operation is from the few meters to over four, uh, three. 100 meters. Most often 3D models created with, the, with this, this group of scanners are generated of monochromatic or multicolored point clouds with the possibility of generating also mesh and texture. Some models of 3D laser scanners are also used to scan medium and small sizes from competing with optical scanners. Precisely made 3D models of museum objects are an excellent measuring tool. They allow to create cross section in any places and calculate the surface and volume of the scanned object. 3D models made of museology should be distinguished not only according to their method of generation, but also into the two bases uh, qualitative categories, presentation models and documentation models. The category of presentation models refers to all internet application media presentation, including VR, RR and VR, which museums create as a part of their public mission. Documentation 3D models are used to reproduce artifacts with high precision and measuring of single scan, a dense and mesh and triangular accuracy uh, protruding the scanned surface and high precision of combining scans, creating the complete, uh, complete scanned object. These models are used mainly in con conservation works, archiving the state of presentation before and after conservation and reconstruction, and in the documentation of artifacts and scientific research conducted in museum. Precise measurement and calculating 3D drawing documentation measurement section. Uh, presentation 3D models can be successfully uh, used on popular platforms on web portals such as Sketchfab and from uh, there posted embedded accord according to their needs and ideas in social media, or, uh, websites, online catalogs, collections, and in database systems used for inventory and scientific purposes. 3D models from the National Maritime Museum are available online on a virtual open museum Rex in the Gulf of Gdansk at site, as you, you see, 
wsw.nmm.pl where there are also photogrammetric 3D models of 25 wrecks and 3D models of the artifacts from them. 3D models of monuments from museum collections are also included in, in the online catalog at the collectie.nmm.pl and on the website sketchfab.com nmm. The 3D models of the includes uh, in NMM on the online catalog. So besides this no, normal, we can see we can we can say normal photography. We are, we also can use the animation of uh, 3D models and models on the Sketchfab. In my opinion, is very useful and. Um, is, it's, it's a way of new version of the um, catalogs online in the museums. 3D models of, our, of, of artifacts and wrecks presented on the Virtual Air Museum of the Wrecks in the Gulf of Gdansk and Sketchfab.com. Um, this is a, this is a screens of these um, sites. So of course, everyone I invite to visit this, this our this sites. If are it's something new for for the person, so let's um, let visit this, this site in the, in the future. So this is uh, all of my presentation. I think. Um, the information can be useful, especially for the people who work in the museums, other museums. Maybe some of you want to, to establish a new um, way of digitalization. Our experience, I think, is uh, quite um, could be um, useful for, for the rest of the museums. And of course, we're waiting for the new information from our museums. Maybe we can. Um, the same, the same options, the same new ways uh, used in our museum. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Tomasz uh, Bednarz, uh, for your presentation. Uh, thank you for the broad introduction of digital activities of uh, National uh, okay, Maritime uh, Museum. Uh, we we have a unique chance to to. Uh, to, to see this experience, um, uh, how how the, the workshop of underwater archaeologists looks like, and uh, how uh, we can combine the new techniques uh, and the development of uh, documentation techniques, uh, um, and how we how can it affect um, the exhibition program of the museum, and how how uh, these uh, new tools could be used. Uh, uh, during educational activities uh, led by uh, the institution. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, and now I would like to, to ask um, Karolina um, uh, Tabaka, Tabak um, uh, from a National Museum in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, I would like to, uh, to present uh, also Karolina uh, Tabaka. She, uh, she is the head uh, of the digitalization and uh, visual documentation uh, department in uh, National Museum in Warsaw. She uh, supervises um, the um, documentation digitalization process in this uh, museum. She was also uh, responsible for uh, numerous um, digitalization projects led in, um, in this museum. So, for example, uh, Open National Museum Digitalization and Access to National Museum Collection a project that was uh, co-financed uh, by European funds and uh, also currently um, Karolina Tabak supervised the, the project uh, uh, here Digitis, uh, digitalization and access to national uh, museum collection uh, so um, we uh, hope that um, we, we can uh, now uh, see other uh, good practice, other good examples of uh, the way that museum can uh, communicate and can use digital documentation uh, to um, to develop the communication with uh, with its public. So I pass the floor to to Karolina Tabak.
thank you very much. I will just put the share screen if it works. Yes, you see it. Yes. Um, hello. Um, in uh, during this uh, short presentation, I would like to uh, to show you different tools that are used in our museum in terms of popularizing the collections, education, and uh, and promotion. Uh, as it was said that during the pand pandemic, um, the the only platform that uh, for contact with art and with our audience was um, was the internet. Uh, the joint activities of the employees of our our museum uh, began to quickly bear fruit in the form of uh, growing numbers of users um, participating both online events and in the number of visitors of our website. Um, I would like to show. Uh, various forms of uh, reaching the viewer, both those uh, calculated for participation and those that leave our viewers uh, room for their own research. Uh, a few years um, before the pandemic, we started to think how to keep up with the new form of activities of our audience and began a sort of our digital strategy. And uh, first and our fundamental task was seeking our audience, the digital audience. Uh, in 2013, we have launched our online catalog, Digital National Museum in Warsaw. Uh, the interest was quite high, but after a few years, we saw it just kind of stopped. Uh, and then we were seeking an, another direction and also these online, online places that were used but uh, by most of our, our audience, but not only the museum audience, but just the internet audience. So um, then we started a cooperation with the Wikipedia, um, with the Wikimedia Foundation in Poland. Uh, we have shared a number of high quality images in Wikimedia Commons, so it could be used in uh, many, many articles in Wikipedia all over the world. Each object, each image um, were imported with our metadata from our uh, data, database and with the URL links uh, that linked to our, our website. And we also have conducted two projects um, that involved a Wikipedian in residence. Um, uh, it was about two hour exhibitions. So the Wikipedia team, um, they created a number of articles about the history of museum collections. And we have put the high quality uh, images. Uh, so it was uh, the, the numbers of view viewers were really, really high. Uh, the articles were seen in each month about two or three million times all over the world. And highlights of our collections were also made uh, available during the uh, Google Art Project platform and also in uh, Europeana. And uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2020, as a result of the project Open National Museum in Warsaw that was co-financing co from the um, operational program Digital Poland, we have launched a new version of our um, online catalog. And our aim in this project was, in one hand, increasing the, the quality of the images, but also uh, to attract more audience and also um, people who were, aren't specialists, are not familiar with art movement or artist names. We want to encourage uh, a sort of diving in the collection and people just to explore the diversity of the collection of National Museum in Warsaw because we uh, we have objects like from ancient art to uh, really modern art many many types of objects uh, so the catalog is no longer just a repository a kind of digital uh, closed storage but a platform of knowledge with different articles online presentations with uh, themes that are uh, not only in, interesting for the specialists, so such as history of fashion, secrets of conservation, uh, food in art, um, different. We have different interviews with our curators, uh, educational materi materials that can be printed uh, and used, for example, in schools. Um, the images uh, can be downloaded and reused. 
each object has an information about the copyright. So if the object is in the public domain, it can be freely downloaded, shared, uh, and used wherever you want. Um, so you can see also the here on the left side, the metadata that are imported from our internal database. We have uh, longer descriptions and we when we have another uh, materials such as different um, films or interviews, we just embedded the, the, the films from the, for example, from the YouTube. Um, also, uh, thanks to the, uh, our cooperation with Huawei, we have created a virtual exhibition. It was called Poland, the Power of Images. Um, the ex exhibition shows the highlights of Polish paintings from, from the 18th to 19th century. Uh, this exhibition it was held uh, last year at National in Warsaw and two years earlier in France in Louvre Lens. Uh, but due to the pandemic, many people couldn't see it in actually in museum. So I really encourage you in the free time to 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 visit this um, uh, visit this uh, exhibition and it's also available in uh, in English. Um, and here you can see different uh, different articles. It, it was it's um, these articles we put like each each month or even each week, and they are about uh, museum collection, history of the collection, about the exhibitions, and also different events that are uh, that are in the in the museum. Um, of course. Um, uh, our our website is um, adjusted to the WCAG standards. Uh, over 100 all uh, objects are also have uh, audio descriptions. Um, many films and interviews are also translated into the sign language. Um, and here just a quick glimpse of the um, of the data from just this year. Uh, so we have published over 65,000 objects and these are uh, objects like sculptures, painting, but also for example sketchbooks that are, consist uh, many hundreds of images inside. Um, as I said, we have different thematic trails. They are kind of, of presentation that can be also showed in schools and almost 160 articles uh, for, for now. Mm, and this this is quite important for us um, that the website is used really throughout the world. Of course, most of our users, as you can see, are from Poland, so 60%. But just uh, two years earlier, when we had the um, older version of the website that weren't in English, uh, the, the percent of users from Poland was 90%. So we see that each year we can reach the audience from other countries, which is very, uh, very great for us. Uh, just this year, we have uh, uh, 64,000 new, new users. Um, and the most com common uh, operating systems used by our system, you can see, uh, just like in the older version of the website, it was just, just Windows. So we can see that um, because of the design of the, the website that is in responsible web design so it's adjusted to the mobile devices, we can see that um, the website is like mostly viewed uh, by mobile, mobile devices. It's, this is completely new for us because in the older version, it was only uh, only desktop, it was only, only Windows. And um, right now we can see from this data that um, people are starting to using um, digital collection of National Museum just for fun, just for exploring, not only museum staff, not only uh, staff from the other institu um, cultural institutions are using, uh, using this, uh, this website. And so just for this year, we have um, all over uh, 200,000 websites entrances. Uh, but of course, so we can see that we have a very basic fundament um, for uh, different digital activities. Um, but the website is, is for users, but the, the, the space when we can have uh, more interaction with our audience is the social media. Uh, so we, um, our National Museum is active in many different channels. Of course, most of our users um, in social media we have uh, uses Facebook. We have uh, over ninety thousand followers, um, and uh, the the number that is quite important is the range. It's 
um, it can range om almost uh, to millions of, of people uh, and also in Instagram but the thing that is quite new uh, this year and it started during the pandemic is the TikTok um, page um, it, it, with our uh, communications um, our colleague in the communication department, they they saw a quite um, uh, a space uh, that we in our um, in our post we uh, we are not uh, we do not have uh, information that is specialized for very young people, and the place where the young people are is the TikTok. So uh, is, as I know, the numbers of followers is increasing. Maybe it's not so much right now, um, but the 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 range number is very it's very high. It's also because of the the posts are in TikTok are quite um, they are not disappearing after one or two days, but it, it's last uh, about three months. Uh, so the the range of each post is increasing, uh, and. Um, and we see that because of the age of its users, it requires different type of, con of content. But um, And the National Museum in Warsaw was, I think, the first museum in Poland that had this, uh, had this TikTok um, uh, page. So uh, we are observing and ana analyzing how to, how to reach, but we see that um, really the numbers of, of users are, um, are increasing. Uh, we have also, uh, created many podcasts, as you can see, in different channels in Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Uh, we have also a project that was mainly for the uh, for the seniors, uh, and after each podcast, they receive were receiving um, some kind of quiz that they can check uh, the knowledge they 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 receive after um, after the, um, this course. Uh, and as I was mentioning about the TikTok, of course. Um, the different type of content, more fun, more uh, uh, detached from the uh, natural context of the artwork, and for the more most uh, more conservative audience, maybe it's not not so much interesting. Like uh, I'm I'm feeling too old when I'm when I saw this uh, this this platform, uh, but um, the fun. But, but the great thing is that um, between this fun post, uh, we can smuggle a more educational information. Uh, this you can see a quick, a quick glimpse from the, from the film about the um, restoration of the, of the tapestry. So um, you, can, you, you can interest this um, young audience also with more, uh, more serious information, not just, uh, you know, uh, fun TikTok posts. Uh, as and, and uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, also this um, different films, uh, also translated to the sign uh, sign language, um, different um, different interviews with our curators. Um, we we want to have really different materials and very um, uh, interesting offer for uh, each digital audience, but because as we can see. Uh, the the range of the audience is um, is changing. It's not only uh, people between twenty and thirty five, but it's also very young um, students and and youths, but also um, but also seniors are starting to uh, to using the, those digital tools, and we uh, we hope that we will evolve each year and uh, our offer will be uh, more more attractive. And uh, here you can see my colleague from the educational department. She was here actually um, uh, talking about the Roman cook recipes, kitchen recipes. So she, it was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, and also um, our educational department uh, on, made online courses that were seen in over uh, it's in seven, uh, 38 can, different countries, so it's not only European countries, but countries all over the, ro the world. And this you can see here, a quick glimpse of the of one of the uh, discourses about Polish, uh, Polish design. Uh, so as I said, uh, different, very different varieties of um, activities, uh, everything to attract uh, those uh, digital audience. Uh, here you, you can see this about our our branches of the National Museum in Warsaw. 
Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Karolina uh, Tabak, uh, for for this um, interesting presentation. Uh, and we uh, we start uh, from the documentation and digitalization of the collection. But uh, as we may see, good practice uh, how to seek a new uh, audience and how to uh, adapt or combine some tools uh, to uh, uh, create the, the links and to communicate with uh, with youths or even with uh, seniors uh, in the virtual space. So now uh, there is a place and a chance to, to discuss not only the, the presentation that we uh, previously saw, uh, but also uh, to discuss uh, the ways that we would like uh, um, to, um, uh, to implement in our other museums, in other institutions, and maybe we can uh, discuss uh, with our uh, specialist uh, the, the ways uh, of um, um, organizing the data produced in the process of digitalization to enhance uh, the usage of, uh, of these materials and to, um, to, to, to reach a broader audience. So uh, I would like to, to open the discussion and invite our uh, the representation uh, representatives of other institutions. So uh, Alexandra Janos uh, uh, is the director of uh, Centrum Cifrowe and the head uh, of the Open Culture Studio within its structures. It's also the curator of um, Exercising um, Modernity uh, program and co-creator and curator of Museum uh, Laboratory I Initiatives. Um, she specializes in the analysis and the implementation of uh, participatory strategies, uh, audience and digital transformation uh, research, so as well as a, a opening audience to heritage uh, resources. Uh, and we also uh, host uh, here um, Anna Shawas, uh, although I do not see our colleague. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just yeah. uh, didn't see, see your, uh, your photo. I'm sorry. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> uh, so Anna Shawas, um, she's a social media expert and art historian and uh, a creator of um, co-creator of an art blog, um, Art and Coffee, and a co-owner of um, digital media agency specializing in engaging cultural uh, content. Uh, she uh, also um, uh, cooperate with um, National Museum in Warsaw uh, and uh, the, the project um, um, and also with the, the art theater in Warsaw. And uh, uh, she is a member of uh, ADESTA Network uh, for Audience uh, Development and Practitioners across uh, the Europe uh, group. So uh, can I uh, pass uh, the floor to, uh, to our specialist and uh, open the discussion about uh, uh, the way to seek new, new audience and to uh, adapt uh, digital tools to, to reach uh, the broader um, target groups. Uh, may I ask Alexandra Janus? <laughs> Ooh. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. And hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it was really interesting to listen to, uh, to both presentations. And it shows, in my opinion, how much effort was made to actually stay relevant in the time of the pandemic and to stay in touch with the audiences. And I wanted to start with congratulation, congratulating my colleagues <laughs> from both museums for doing such a great job in such a difficult situation. And when it comes to, to the question you have asked, um, I think when it comes to the, the documentation and the data, the, the quality of data is obviously a, a very important issue. And uh, I think this is something that is really like for many institutions still a struggle. This is not an easy process, but I think like if we want these 
resources to circulate very broadly, if we want people to find these resources in other places in the internet than the museum website, then the quality of data is of crucial importance. And that would be my, my first um, remark. And then secondly, I think obviously, and probably we will want to go deep, deeply into that in this conversation, but obviously the standards and the standardization of data is something that again is, is very relevant. And this is probably a more like a geek conversation. <laughs> so, so let's not bore our audiences here, but I think uh, I think this is this is relevant to be mentioned. And then I think, and this was mentioned by I think both presenters, there's also the 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 big uh, question or issue of how to translate these data and these resources into the language of actual humans. <laughs> so first of all, the, the data, the first two remarks was mostly about like how to translate this for machines, and but we also have to translate it for humans. So obviously when people search for resources, for cultural heritage resources online, they don't usually, they often don't remember the name of the painter or the artist, but they often don't just search for a particular image. They sometimes just search for some search for something that is, as Carolina has mentioned, fashion or something interesting or something beautiful or flowers. And I think this is like very important to also like be ready for such non-expert audiences that might be searching for these collections online without having a very clear idea of the particular work they are looking for. And I think this is something that is very relevant, like, and this is really like opening up for the audiences that are non-expert audiences that might want to find something without having a very clear idea of what they are looking for. So I would say like starting the conversation when it comes to data and documentation, my perspective and from my perspective as the audience researcher, I would start with these few remarks and I hand it over to, to my colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, these uh, di directions uh, where we should, uh, should uh, go to, to reach uh, the broader audience. Um, can I ask uh, Anna Shawas to, to comment uh, on these uh, questions? Of course, yeah. Uh, and first of all, thanks so much for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think what uh, Alexandra Yanus said about the quality of the data, that's, uh, that's it's crucial because things online, especially, uh, they, they need to be attractive. Um, they may not be attractive to everyone, and that's fine. Uh, but in itself, especially as a, as a public institution, like people expect impeccable quality uh, from from you know the images, the photos, the the stories, the uh, you know the um, the text themselves. They they expect um, very solid uh, you know knowledge and also good looking stuff, basically. <laughs> especially online, of course, I am focused on social media, and uh, it's it's um, it's purely but basically purely visual uh, media and it heavily relies on uh, on, on good looking images films um, so this is very important uh, for sure uh, so not only the metadata that is being described that like you know as a social media manager I would love to be able to easily look for um, you know I don't know images of flowers or snowy landscape when it's snowing you know of course the real-time marketing you know we, we need like information fast and uh, it will be great to have it, it's great to have portals like Europeana or um, others uh, that are, you know, kind of joining in uh, a lot of um, a lot of institutions together, so for, for easier search. Um, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Alexandra's uh, what she said about the story. That the storytelling aspect is so important because uh, you know it's it's what what the museums are showing really they, they are the stories because you know we kept certain things because of something like you know the uh, ships uh, you know the the uh, gift of the pomerania or paintings they are stories and this is what's the, the human aspect and the human element that's interesting and that grabs the um grabs uh, grabs the attention so <laughs> it's it's very important to kind of be able to uh you know, <laughs> really like nail it and, and to take it out. And uh, because, you know, that's, that's what 
people want to see and uh, they, they are starved for that. Um, and, and yeah, in this way, because like we know for a fact that people uh, are, are more inclined to like recommend, like take something uh, from other people, like especially when, when a friend is recommending it, uh, then we are more likely to actually engage in some content or, or whatever. So it's even more important to, for it to be um, really interesting, really engaging and really you know worthy um, so that especially online on the, on the social media, it can sp spread socially, <laughs> basically. Um, uh, I think you're muted, uh, Alexander. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, comments and uh, um, for uh, telling us more about the quality of data because uh, it's not so obvious. Um, because uh, when we talk about the digitalization, we often uh, talk about uh, the, the very high definition uh, pictures and uh, uh, and data that it's not so um, that are, that are um, crucial for our documentation process, but uh, but this is more uh, uh, human or the social uh, approach to to the quality of uh, of data. So thank you very much for for this. Um, if uh, we that there there were some. Uh, Target group already mentioned uh, that we we have uh, in in Gdansk there was the idea to uh, to show uh, the public with disabilities uh, the exhibition that it's not reachable for for them. Uh, we we had um, Karolina Tabak mention um, youth as the user of TikTok and uh, the possibility to communicate with uh, with them. Uh, um, as, as a new new way to, to reach uh, um, and find a new audience in the virtual space and also uh, seniors. Um, could you please uh, tell us more about this uh, this project for seniors and uh, because we are um, we also may may look for for groups that are uh, can we include into this uh, cultural activity of uh, our institution? Um, may I ask Karolina Tabak? Uh, yes, I can say a few years, a few words about this uh, project for for seniors. Um, uh, it was uh, called, uh, I, I think, the power of art. Yes, uh, we it, uh, during this project, um, the educational department they created um, over seventy five different post podcasts. Uh, it was um, some kind of like uh, course course about the history of art. So it uh, was from the from the pyramids, uh, ancient art until the till the modern art. Different different uh, themes. Uh, so um, the group of interest, the the the, the users of the uh, of this course, they uh, were receiving uh, links and to the to, to the podcasts. So they can uh, they can be able to participate in this uh, in in the meeting and as I said after each meeting um, it was like a presentation with um, uh, with uh, with the, the guide and after the presentation they were receiving a test so as a as an online course some kind of they can check. Uh, were the, the information during this course uh, if they were learning something or not. Uh, so I know that the, this course even received some kind of um, uh, prizes. Uh, maybe I, I cannot say more specific because uh, the data because it, it was my, my department, I'm responsible for the digitiz digitization process. Uh, but uh, if you have any additional questions, I can. Uh, I can give you also contact so my colleague she is the coordinator of this uh, of this project thank you uh, thank you very much um, we uh, so we we can uh, uh, include a new audience into uh, via virtual space but uh, are there any uh, group that are still excluded for for our from our digital um, activities and what uh, what uh, could be done by the museums to uh, 
to help them um, to to take part in cultural life uh, in in the future. Um, that's I don't know. Uh, uh, Alexandra Janus, maybe you may may answer this question. It's a difficult one, so I can promise I will try. Um, I think the the big issue is that museums, after taking this crash course in digital transformation during the pandemic, they discovered new audiences. And I think that a huge challenge is not to leave the old audiences behind, right? And I don't mean the age of the audiences, but the fact that the the audience that that all the audiences that were already there. And I think like obviously the the older audiences, I mean the older age groups might be digitally excluded, but this might be a, a oversimplification, right? Because like these these groups are also like very different when it comes to the, the competences and digital literacy. So I think what is important is to actually start new audience research to actually and I think this is something and I know that from the research that we have done uh, at Centrum Cifrobe that many cultural heritage professionals and museum professionals say that the main challenge for them now is the lack of data about the new audiences they were starting to reach during the pandemic so they basically don't know yet to whom they are talking and to to whom they are exactly reaching out and i think this is this is the gap that we we should try to bridge and then like see who is represented and who is not represented and obviously there are some groups that might benefit from this like new digital uh, programs for example people that are homebound because they are caregivers or like they are responsible for other family members so they are not maybe that eager to come to the actual building but they can benefit from from the offer online but at the other hand there are many groups for whom being physically in the museum is very important and i think we should like focus on these on researching these uh, these ways in which different audience groups are participating in culture also including these these new groups that museums started reaching reaching to uh, during the pandemic to actually be able to build any meaningful strategies and i know this is like this is a big, big task that i am now describing and it uh, it requires resources and it requires effort but i would say this is this is the best way to go if if we can if we can do that okay thank you thank you very much uh, and i would like uh, also to, to ask anna shawas uh, to to help us to solve this uh, difficult question uh, and describe uh, more from from the social media perspective the uh, the structure of uh, museum uh, audience uh, during the the pandemic, uh, how how it changed? Do do we know something only from from the existence on the the museum uh, website or museum social media? Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to generalize because you know every every museum tackled the issue differently. Um, I think it it will you know the pandemic itself. Uh, was a, a great chance for for museums to kind of break through and start making stuff for uh, for other new audiences and that was very important um i feel like you know the the easy answer would be to say like oh you know elderly people don't use social media but it's not true um because, <laughs> because you know um we have people who are young adults who you know don't use social media and we have seniors who are you know on YouTube uh, for a few hours a day. So it's, you know, the age is not the only metric to, to, to go on. Um, but it is true that like, you know, elderly people, usually there's there's more elderly people on YouTube and there's more, I don't know, young women on, uh, on Instagram. And, you know, there are certain um, demographics that are rather, you know, they're the same everywhere. It's not just museum, it's, it's really like the, the uh, the, the demographics for, for certain platforms. Um, so that's why, you know, TikTok, uh, it, in the beginning of the pandemic, it used to be teens between 13 and 17, uh, but actually now the um, latest, uh, one of the latest reports says that actually over 30% and, uh, no, sorry, even more, um, is uh, actually people between, uh, I think it was 18 and 35. So it totally shifted due to the pandemic. 
uh, you know, all the like millennials uh, started using it. So it's not just, you know, teen, pre-teens dancing anymore. It is young people, young adults looking for all sorts of um, content. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult to generalize really. Uh, I do feel like uh, because of the sheer amount of content that was created uh, f- by the institutions, of course, uh, it also naturally made it so that more people are possibly interested in it because there's just a larger variety of it. And the focus is, was strictly on, on the digital uh, world. So also people knew to, to look for it. Uh, I think one of the barriers is that a lot of people don't even think about, you know, looking for stuff uh, online, uh, looking for artwork uh, and looking for uh, tour guide, uh, guided tours or anything. So um, I think that was, a, a, you know, the, the blessing in disguise, of course, uh, of a very nastily disguised, <laughs> but uh, th- there is some good uh, that, that came out of it. And I feel like Polish museums really uh, were able to, take that chance and uh, actually use it nicely so <laughs> okay. so thank you so we uh, still we not know everything uh, but but um, but we we are we are for sure gaining a new audience and what uh, can we do uh, what kind of collaboration may help museums to uh, to reach even a wider uh, audience uh, if anyone would like to start this uh, discussion. I think that um, the thing that is very important that the institutions um, not operate alone. uh, um, It's very important to have uh, lots of different collaborations. And um, we also uh, think that many of the digital materials that we are producing, uh, these are great materials for schools. Uh, and really, we often forget about how uh, how great audience our schools because they can um, learn, they can see our collection, but also they can learn how to use digital tools. Uh, I think that is very uh, quite important to have uh, in uh, first grades some kind of education how to use digital tools that uh, kids can. Uh, have different projects in school, different really simple tasks, but when, when they can know where, where to find them, they can really, uh, they can really uh, start to, uh, to use them. So uh, not only seniors, but I think the, um, the digital tools should be educated in schools. And we have also created uh, numbers of thematic collections that were uh, uh, that uh, that were designed um, along with the educational program, so the teacher can uh, can have uh, a numbers of um, already done presentations. For example, enlightenment or uh, I don't know um, uh, history of Egypt, and they have, can have uh, uh, ready examples for schools, so they can use in the classroom. They have projectors, and uh, these are these are materials that can be just just used or printed or so on. So uh, I think the, the, and the cooperation that I was telling about the Wikipedia, but I think the the fields of cooperation for the big institutions are really. Uh, really great and big. We can have also different cooperations with the bloggers or uh, people that have can uh, really make uh, our collections more attractive to the range, uh, very broad audience. If I might add something, because I wanted to just uh, give a heads up to what Carolina has just said, because in the research we have in the research project we have done at Centrum Cifrava this year, it was really striking that uh, in fact teachers were a very significant um, recipients of the um, digital content that was made available by museums and this was like a, this was a european wide study so this is something that is already happening and we should strengthen that and i think carolina is absolutely right about that and i wanted to mention three more things and this is again based on the on the research we've done about the culture in the pandemic so first of all I think heritage professionals and museum professionals are well aware that 
the, the programming should change. We cannot just program the way we program on site and then move it online. We have to have a different strategy of programming for the, for the digital because these are different audiences and different ways in, of interacting with, with these resources. And then second thing is that I think also institutions have to review the resources and the collections they have, but also like human resources, the collections as a resource, but also like the competences, the, the know-how that they have in the institution and see what they can actually make available or what they can mainstream, not only to, to support like other groups, like the teachers, for example, but also like to make sure that this programming is sustainable and it's actually reaching some actual needs. And then the third thing, and this is also related to the to the comment that Carolina has made about Wiki, Wikimedia, is that the, the, the great rule, if we want to go broader, because that, that is not something that we necessarily need to want to do but if we want to go broader then I think there is this golden rule go where your audience is so start mainstreaming your resources in the platforms or in the tools or in places online where your target audiences are actually hanging out and obviously Wikipedia is an amazing resource because almost all of us hang out on Wikipedia from time to time but then like all the other types of media as well so but but I think this all kind of like comes down to the strategic planning and strategic thinking. And I think like this, this was particularly difficult in the pandemic. We know that. So it's easier said than done. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. About my some kind of idea. Uh, when you think about the digitalization in my field, in my point of view, especially when we think about the 3D documentation, uh, we prepare something, some uh, some new uh, so new idea to for an offer for the museums, like museum like us, for example, to prepare a special a special kind of exhibition called as an internet exhibition, prepared only in the internet, which could be, um, which could be connected with the 3D models and other, uh, other uh, uh, digitalization equipment and could be posted to the, to the social media in different way, in different kinds. And of, co of course, the, the topic of this uh, exhibitions should be, um, of course, uh, prepared by the specialists from the museums, and in this in this time when where is a pandemic or post-pandemic time, we, we I think we, we can prepare this kind of uh, offer for the for the um, for the people who live in in, in the country. Uh, it sometimes we could it, uh, we could uh, make this uh, only in the internet. And not in the in the museum uh, in a physical uh, physical way. So this is my uh, my suggestions because now we we prepare in our collections on online, for example, uh, the the characteristic elements and the monuments. Which, for for example, I can say that you have a collection of the vessels from the Vistula River, historical vessels from Vistula River. There is a for example, 15 or 20 different models. And now we create the 3D models of these models. <laughs> and uh, finally, we can put this as the internet exhibition. But now in the, our perma permanent exhibition, we have only models in the, in the, in the, in the uh, showcases. But uh, the special ways with the multimedia, uh, specially prepared for the different ways of uh, publication for, for the different uh, social media. And I, I think in the next year, we, we have a plan to, 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 to show this kind of uh, presentation. Uh, of course, um, not now is uh, this idea, uh, but when we complete this 3D documentation, we, we try to implement this, um, this, um, this project to our offer. So. 
Thank you. Uh, and um, th this is the question about the future and the answer about the future. Because um, when we, we talk about and we think about the pandemic, we have uh, some kind of hope that it will finish somehow and we will we'll come back to, to the status quo. But in the, in the aspect of virtual space of museums, uh, I think that we do, do not really want to come back to the status quo because uh, this, uh, uh, this way of communication will be the, the crucial part of the communication with the audience in, in the future and what kind of tools uh, will survive and uh, what kind of uh, ways of communication will stay for, for us uh, for longer. Just anyone <laughs> would like to answer, and of course the the chat is open. Uh, if anyone from uh, from the audience would like to ask the question for uh, to the presenters or to to other um, members of the discussion, uh, it will be really nice to hear from from you. Uh, I can say that the um, the new activity that were. Uh, Invent that were launched during the pandemic was the broadcasting of the lecturers and of the uh, courses. So I think that this uh, this is something that will last uh, because it showed us how many people can um, to how many people can uh, attendance in such an event. Uh, normally, the lectures it's in our museum cinema, so it's um, it has about thirty to forty uh, attendants. But if we broadcast such a lecture in, for example, in Facebook, we have like over 500. So uh, I think that each event that is going to be in National Museum, it it will be broadca broadcast. Of course, everything that is um, related to the digitization and the online catalog, it it was before the pandemic and it's still going to be uh, going to be digital. But I think that during the next years. I think that's going to be some new activities because we are still, you know, exploring and uh, maybe something new will occur. I uh, agree that the video formats are, are definitely something that uh, will be sticking around, at least from social media perspective. It is, it is known that both Facebook and Instagram are making the shifts towards the video formats, um, just as TikTok, because they do see that as a, serious competition so um it all started with youtube you know the like social media craze and it seems like it's it's going back to that point uh where just captivating video content uh is great because it can also be used by by you know people with uh, several impairments because you can of course uh, make it accessible uh, by captioning by audio description um, you can just have the, you know, convert into podcasts, which is, of course, not ideal, but still, um, I feel like uh, this is something that uh, the museums, uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, National Museum will be sticking around. Uh, I have been watching more lectures since the pandemic in <laughs> National Museums uh, than, than ever, and it's been great. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that this is something that uh, will also make it so that the audience, the new audience that the were reached during the pandemic will not be left alone and will just not be you know forgotten about and it's it's a way to keep the relationship going um so do, do we know something more about this uh, um this audience uh, in the future and the tools uh, that we can use to to help um uh, to, 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 to still uh, be in touch with the virtual audience because we, we want to, to have uh, to be in touch with uh, our audience in, in real space, but in virtual space in the future, we can, uh, we can uh, have it through video uh, um, informations and videos on YouTube, on, uh, on TikTok or, uh, or in other social media. And uh, we, we can do it by lectures, but uh, uh, what, what are the, the other uh, possibilities uh, to, uh, to find uh, some, some new ways uh, of communicating with, with people uh, for museums? Um, I, I can try um, answer to that, and I think like the 
probably I, I won't be naming any tools or any particular solution, but I would say flexibility is probably <laughs> the thing we should be focusing on because the, the, the tech is changing very rapidly and it is changing without, like it's absolutely beyond our control what the, this or the other platform is going to do and how the algorithm is going to change. So I think we have to embrace the fact that we, we can actually predict that and we will never have control over that and we are not uh, an, an equal partner in that so I think what is important is and I think this is something that we have we have experienced a lot during the pandemic that we've learned how to be more flexible and how to like respond to these changes and I think this is something that probably will stay with us um, because we are unable to actually shape these solutions and I but I also think this might be a good thing because then I think the institutions should focus less on developing their own tools and more on just basically adjusting to the platforms that are developed by others because the costs of like um, being in this race <laughs> are too high and obviously like just being of obs just observing and trying to keep up it's not a comfortable position but I, I think it's my it's a better strategy so I think flexibility and and this observation and actually being responsive is is something that we we should actually be focused on just to pile on it absolutely I think uh what Alexandra says is uh, spot on because don't worry about finding new tools. They will find you. The key is to stay open about it and uh, make sure to actually kind of think about it creatively, how could you can use the tools that come to you. Um, even if they seem silly, they, there's a high chance they will become mainstream and they will become valuable things. And then if you stay ahead of the game, then you can use it creatively and kind of be on a higher level than than uh, than the others. So it's important to kind of keep an open mind, um, yeah, and and use the tools that are are already there, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, so from from the beginning of pandemic, when we had to learn very quickly uh, as a museum staff, uh, and we had to. Uh, make our small revolution in the way that we uh, communicate with the audience and look for, for new uh, ideas. And uh, as, as you suggest, uh, we should still uh, have the same openness and flexibility uh, in the future just to, to look for a solution that will help us to seek a new audience or to um, to stabilize our connection with uh, our permanent uh, visitors um, and uh, to, to, to be open to uh, rearrange uh, our way of uh, presenting exhibitions or uh, programming uh, educational uh, offer and we can uh, still combine it with uh, the digitalization of um, the music museum uh, collection and to uh, uh, to be aware of a uh, high quality data because at the beginning of the pandemic uh, each museum create some content uh, i say some content uh, on on youtube or any other ways of communication that uh, this the, such a institution had um, possible uh, but uh, some some of this um, some of these solutions are uh, didn't didn't survive uh, long, and we we have to look for for the quality ways of uh, communication with uh, with the audience. So uh, so I don't know if you uh, agree that we should be open, flexible, and uh, directed to the high quality uh, content for for the future audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see any questions on our chat, but if uh, if someone uh, would like to ask, we still have uh, seven minutes till the end of our session. Um, feel free to, to answer uh, chat or you can also um, join uh, to our uh, discussion with video. And while we're waiting for the question, maybe I'll just flag one thing. I think we absolutely agree, and I think we agreed <laughs> that the, this is direction, but obviously 
there are some needs that have have to be fulfilled to actually make this possible. I think like there's there's a profound need to support museum professionals and museum staff in adapting this 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 working culture basically because it's easy to say flexibility and then if you are if you need to plan ahead and if you if you need to like uh, decide ahead the strategies that you will do next year flexibility is not that much an option so it, I think we sh we should support uh, cultural heritage professionals in general, museum professionals in particular, because we are discussing museums here, to actually have these possibilities and to adjust to this new work working culture. And I think this is this is a big challenge. That it's not a challenge that is related with technology, but is the challenge that is related with the the ways we work and the ways this has to change for this vision to be possible. So thank you for, for this comment. So the virtual museum is, uh, is something that uh, we have to learn still all the time, uh, ongoing process, lifelong learning. And uh, it is uh, something that we also should learn or sometimes we have to learn our uh, audience or some groups in uh, our audience as uh, Karolina Tabak uh, said about school and uh, and not only we uh, we offering resources on our uh, website, but we also uh, are some support uh, for um, development of digital competences of, uh, of our audience too sometimes. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is something uh, that we we need to uh, to learn and to be up to date uh, all the time. So, does anyone would like to? Uh, okay, Anahita, I see your yeah, hands just, up. Yeah, I just want to because I cannot see any any question, and I just want to say that um, I just put the links to um, all of our uh, speakers. So, if you had any further questions after after the session, you can reach them by clicking those links. And uh, yeah, this is just, just, just giving you the information about that. If if you have any question after, thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Anahita. Thanks uh, everyone for your presentation and uh, participation in uh, in discussion. Um, and okay, I see many thanks uh, from Alicia de Rosette that uh, also was the organizer of uh, today's uh, session. And thanks uh, everyone uh, for today's presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.